Welcome to Your Space Journey, where we venture into the future of space exploration. Your journey begins now. You know, SpaceX is making some serious waves with their Starship rocket, right? Yeah. Well, get this. China is developing their own super heavy lift rocket. It's called the Long March 9. Huh? And the design that they just revealed yeah. looks surprisingly similar to Starship. Hmm. So today's deep dive is all about figuring out what exactly is going on here. Mm. Is this straight up copying? Is it clever adaptation? Right. Or something else entirely? Well, what I find really fascinating here is that the new Long March 9, which they just showed off at an air show recently, really does resemble Starship visually. I mean, you see it and it has that same like sleek stainless steel look. Yeah. A reusable first stage. Uh -huh. And even those distinctive flaps for controlling the descent back to Earth. Right. And like Starship, it's designed to run on methane and liquid oxygen engines. OK, but it can't be like identical right like yeah. th those flaps positioned in almost the exact same spot i mean yeah. that seems a little too specific to be just a coincidence you're right the designs aren't identical for instance the long march 9 will have 30 engines okay while starship uses 33. Hmm. and that likely means less overall thrust for the chinese rocket but the similarities do raise some interesting questions yeah. about how designs kind of evolve and whether there are only so many ways to build a truly effective like super heavy lift reusable rocket so are we saying that there's a limited number of optimal solutions when you're dealing with the physics of launching something that massive yeah. and then landing it back safely? Yeah, that's exactly what's so intriguing about this. You know, th the laws of physics and engineering, they do impose certain constraints. Yeah. You know, think of it like designing a supersonic aircraft. There's a reason why so many of them end up with similar shapes, right? Yeah. It's all about minimizing drag and maximizing efficiency. Yeah. And the same principles apply to rockets, really. Okay, that makes sense. But those flaps, they're not just for looks right. Right. They have a specific purpose. Absolutely. Those flaps are crucial for maneuvering the rocket during descent and controlling its landing. Okay. And they have to be very precisely positioned and sized to interact with the airflow in just the right way. So the fact that both Starship and the Long March 9 feature these similar flap systems right. suggests that, you know, maybe certain design solutions just simply work best for achieving that controlled reentry and landing. So maybe both teams arrived at similar solutions independently. Yeah, it's possible. Right. But it's also worth noting that China has kind of a history of drawing inspiration from SpaceX. Hmm. Remember their Mars helicopter that looked a lot like NASA's Ingenuity? Yeah. Or that earlier Starship-like launch system concept they revealed a few years back? Yeah. There is even a Chinese company called Cosmoleap that proposed a like rocket-catching tower very similar to the one SpaceX uses. So it's starting to feel like a pattern here. Yeah. But is it really fair to call it copying if they're ultimately making their own modifications and adapting the technology to their own needs? Yeah, that's the key question, isn't it? I mean, it's a complex issue. While some people might call it copying, sure. China also has a robust and independent space program with its own impressive track record of achievements. Right. And to be fair, re reusability is a game changer for space exploration. It makes missions more affordable and sustainable. Yeah. So it makes sense that multiple nations are going to be pursuing these similar technologies. Right. Because at the end of the day, the goal is to get to space, mm -hmm. you know, right. efficiently. But let's not forget the kind of rivalry aspect of all this. I mean, SpaceX has already had several successful test flights with Starship. Uh -huh. And they're aiming to have it fully operational really soon, potentially even supporting NASA's lunar missions by 2026. That's right. Meanwhile, China's targeting a 2033 debut for the Long March 9. OK. So there's definitely a race going on here. Yeah. And both countries have really set their sights on some ambitious goals, including crewed missions to the moon and even Mars. OK, so we've got similar designs, a bit of a space race brewing. But before we jump to any conclusions, right. let's take a closer look at the bigger picture here. What are the strategic implications of China's entry into the kind of reusable rocket arena? Yeah. We'll be back after a quick break to discuss just that. Sounds good. If you're enjoying this interview, be sure to subscribe. Thanks for listening. So before the break, we were talking about the similarities between China's Long March 9 and SpaceX's Starship and how that kind of plays into this larger space race. Right. Now, let's zoom out a bit and think about what this all means for the future of space exploration. Okay, so zoom out for us. 
China is now a serious player in the reusable rocket game. Yeah. What's the long-term impact of that? It's potentially huge. For decades, one of the biggest hurdles to space exploration has been the sheer cost of getting things off the Earth. Right. But reusable rockets like Starship and eventually the Long March 9 could dramatically lower launch costs. Hmm. And this could unlock all kinds of possibilities that were previously just out of reach. Like what? Give us some examples. Well, for starters, imagine more frequent and more ambitious scientific missions. We could send larger and more sophisticated probes to distant planets and moons. Yeah. Maybe even set up permanent research outposts on the lunar surface. Wow, that would be incredible. Yeah. Well, science is always a good thing. But what about kind of beyond research? Are there commercial applications too? Absolutely. Cheaper launches could make space tourism more accessible, opening it up to a much wider audience. And it could even pave the way for things like asteroid mining, where we could extract these valuable resources from space to benefit Earth. Okay, now we're talking about whole new space economy. Right. But let's not forget about the geopolitical angle here. It's great that more countries are getting involved in space. Yeah. But there's also an element of competition, right? You're right. We can't ignore that. Space is becoming an increasingly important strategic domain. <sighs> there's a sense of national pride attached to space achievements. And as China's global influence grows, right. so too does their desire to be a leader in space. So it's not just about like scientific curiosity or even commercial opportunities. Oh, right. There's this power dynamic at play, too. Exactly. The U.S. has long been the dominant force in space. Yeah. But now China is really emerging as a serious contender. Right. And that creates this dynamic that's both exciting and potentially challenging. I mean, it could fuel innovation and really accelerate progress. Sure. But it also carries the risk of kind of escalating tensions and even conflict. That's a sobering thought. So how do we ensure that space remains a peaceful domain for exploration and discovery? That's the million dollar question. We need strong international cooperation and a commitment to shared principles. Right. Things like space debris mitigation, responsible use of space resources, right. and clear communication to avoid misunderstandings. All those things are crucial. It sounds like we need some ground rules for this new era of space exploration. Yeah. But beyond just the rules, isn't there something inherently inspiring about humans you know, reaching for the stars no matter what country they're from? Absolutely. At its core, space exploration is all about pushing the boundaries of human knowledge and understanding our place in the universe. Yeah. You know, that shared sense of wonder and the pursuit of something bigger than ourselves. That's what ultimately unites us. OK, I'm feeling a bit more optimistic now. Mm -hmm. But let's be realistic. I mean, competition is a powerful motivator. Yeah. We see it everywhere from sports to business to, well, space exploration. Right. So how do we balance that competitive spirit with the need for cooperation? That's the challenge. And it's one that will require careful thought and diplomacy. But I think there's room for both. You know, competition can drive innovation and push us to achieve great things, yeah. while cooperation ensures that we do so responsibly and for the benefit of all humankind. So maybe it's not about choosing one over the other, right. but finding a way for them to kind of coexist and push us forward together. Precisely. Yeah. And who knows, maybe this current rivalry could eventually evolve into a more collaborative relationship. Mm. Imagine a future where international teams of astronauts representing diverse nations work together on these ambitious missions to the moon, Mars, and beyond. Wouldn't that be something? Now, that's a vision worth striving for. Yeah. You know, it, it's amazing to think that just a few decades ago, yeah. the idea of reusable rockets was practically science fiction. I know, right? And now we're talking about multiple countries having this capability. Uh -huh. It really feels like we're entering this new era of space exploration. It really is an incredible time to be witnessing these advancements for sure. And it's not just about the technology itself. It's about what that technology enables. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're talking about opening up access to space right. in ways that we could only dream of before. Exactly. But it's not just about, like, getting to space right. Right. It's about what we do when we get there. What are the big, like, questions or the big goals yeah. that are really driving this new era of space exploration? Well, one of the most fundamental questions that has captivated humanity for centuries is whether we're alone in the universe. You know, the search for life beyond Earth right. is a driving force for so many scientists and space agencies around the world. So the possibility of finding alien life, even if it's just like microbial life, yeah. 
that would be a game changer, wouldn't it? Absolutely. It would completely revolutionize our understanding of biology, evolution, our place in the cosmos. Yeah. And with these powerful new telescopes like the James Webb Space Telescope right. and all these upcoming missions to Mars mm -hmm. and the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn, mm -hmm. we're getting closer than ever to potentially answering that question. It's just mind-boggling to think about. Yeah. But let's say we do find evidence of life somewhere else. Yeah. What then? What are the like next steps for humanity in space? Well, if we're truly serious about becoming a spacefaring species, yeah. about establishing a long-term human presence beyond Earth, uh -huh. then we need to start thinking about sustainability. We mm -hmm. can't just keep relying on Earth for all our resources. Yeah. We need to learn how to live off the land, so to speak. So we're talking about things like extracting water from lunar ice yeah. or using Martian soil to grow food. Exactly. We call it in-situ resource utilization, and it's going to be essential for making these long-duration missions right. and eventual settlements feasible. And it's not just about the physical resources. Mm -hmm. We also need to think about the psychological and social aspects of living in space for extended periods. Yeah, that's right. How do we ensure the mental and physical well-being of astronauts on these, like, long and potentially dangerous missions? It's a critical question. We need to develop these ad advanced life support systems, right. radiation shielding, and uh. countermeasures for the effects of prolonged space flight on the human body. Yeah. And just as importantly, we need to address the psychological challenges of isolation, confinement, right. and the unique stressors of living in such an extreme environment. It sounds like we've got a lot to figure out. Yeah, we do. But it's so exciting to think about all the possibilities, all the challenges that will really push human ingenuity to its limits. It is a grand adventure. Yeah. And it's one that's just beginning. And as we've seen with the development of reusable rockets and these new players like China emerging, it's an adventure that's becoming increasingly global. So as we wrap up this deep dive, what's the kind of key takeaway for our listener, mm -hmm. what should they be thinking about as they ponder the future of space exploration? I think the biggest takeaway is that space exploration is no longer just a national endeavor. Mm. It's really becoming this global enterprise with multiple nations and even private companies right. pushing the boundaries of what's possible. And that means... That means the future of space exploration is a future that we all have a stake in shaping. It's a future full of challenges and opportunities, and it's a future that will really be determined by the choices that we make today. So to our listener, we say this. Stay curious, stay informed, and stay engaged. Yeah. The future of space exploration is in our hands. Yeah. And who knows? Maybe one day you'll be among the pioneers who venture out to explore the vast unknown. Thanks for joining us on this deep dive. Until next time, keep looking up. Your space journey.